So please join me in a big welcome for Amanda. Good morning, it's so nice to be here. We have a little bit of time this morning for a conversation, and I say conversation because although we won't have time for Q&A in this comment this morning, I will be staying for the rest of the day. I'll be around doing a session immediately following this one. I'm happy to chat in between sessions, and I'll also be at the networking event tonight. And so I really do hope that you'll be coming up and buttonholing me and telling me about great work that your organization is doing or questions that you have about a state policy or other issues that are on your mind because um, this is my favorite part of my job, is to interact and hear from folks who are working um, and getting their hands dirty every day. So as Patricia just mentioned, I come from a family of educators. Uh, my parents were early childhood educators, and um, I, uh, I started my career in public libraries. I started working in my local public library when I was 14 years old. And I noticed that in this very small, very white suburb of Philadelphia, we had a lot of immigrant families who had already identified the library as a place of resources. And I thought, wow, folks have been in the country for such a short period of time, and yet they've already identified that this is a resource, a place that um, they can get help with their kids' homework and help with their own English skills and everything else that they might need to become part of US society and to be able to fully contribute their talents. And so that really inspired um, the sort of trajectory of, of my working career. Um, I spent the first six years after college doing program evaluation work for a foundation-funded nonprofit in Philadelphia, and then I spent another nine years at the Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians, which is a nonprofit organization founded by an Irish immigrant who came to the US as a physical therapist and then had to spend three years going through the recredentialing process so that she could practice again in the United States. Um, and it was a great privilege to be able to do the work at the Welcoming Center because um, we were both a, we owe a Title I and Title II funded organization, right? So we had funding for both workforce development and adult education. And that's relatively rare in the immigration world, right? A lot of immigrant serving organizations are refugee resettlement organizations or are legal services agencies or social services. Relatively fewer of them are focused specifically on workforce and adult education. And then three years ago, I had the opportunity to make the move to National Skills Coalition. We are a nonprofit policy advocacy organization. We have 22,000 members across the country. I hope and imagine that many of you in this room are among our members. And our members include adult educators, community colleges, labor unions and labor management partnerships, employers and chambers of commerce, uh, workforce boards, anybody with an interest in making sure that people have access to the education and training they need to be able to earn family sustaining wages. And we focus in particular on middle skilled jobs, so jobs that require more than a high school uh, diploma but not a four year degree. So I told you all that information because I think it's helpful to know where the person you're hearing from is coming from, right? I'm rooted in Philadelphia, I come from a family of educators, I've done the work on the ground. I have a pretty strong bias that if you're doing policy work, you ought to have done the work on the ground. Um, I sometimes joke that in the nonprofit field, a lot of us are VIPs, vertically integrated people. Right? We've all done the reception job and the intake job and the case management and the instruction job. We've written grant proposals, we've schmoozed with funders, we've done the data specialist work, we've done the reporting and compliance, right? Because we have to be able to do all of that but we also have to be able to inform the policy conversations because the policy folks need to hear from us. And I feel really passionately about this. Um, and I hope that many of you feel passionate about it too. Okay, so why did I give you this beautiful green space slide? First of all, because the research says that our blood pressure will go down just by looking at it. Um, not that I'm suggesting you have high blood pressure. Uh, but also because this is precious time, right? Most of you are program administrators, perhaps some of you are direct service staff. 
in the daily hustle and bustle, we are running our organizations and our programs, and we rarely get the chance to step back and think about the big picture. Um, and so when I was talking about this session with Patricia and Jane and, and others and planning it, we said, you know, this is precious time. Let's use it to talk about some big picture things. And I hope that some of what I'm going to share with you this morning um, is going to affirm uh, instincts and beliefs that you already have. Um, perhaps you're going to say to me, gosh, Amanda, we've been doing that, um, which is wonderful, and, I, and I'd love to hear more about that. And I hope that some of it will also spark new ideas and, and new thinking. But that's why I gave you the, the green space slide. So we're going to sort of start with pulling back the camera lens. Then I'm going to give you a little federal policy update, because as somebody who works for a Washington, D.C.-based organization, I'm sort of honor bound to tell you what Congress is up to. Um, and then talk a bit about making our way to the table. Uh, a lot of you may know Dr. Brenda Dan Messier, who was the um, assistant secretary around adult education in OCTE under the Obama administration. And she always talks about how we have to sometimes elbow our way to the table as adult educators. And I think that's pretty true. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about that. And then talking about bringing your practitioner wisdom into the conversation. OK, so let's talk about pulling back that camera lens. Um, this is kind of a laundry list. We're not going to go through these now. I'll come back to this slide. Um, but what all of these uh, items have in common, whether we're talking about regional economic development efforts or reentry services or state longitudinal data systems, is that they all need adult educators, but they don't necessarily know it. Right? So these are activities and initiatives that are going on in your states and communities. In some cases, you may already be at the table and shaping the conversation. In other cases, maybe you're going to have to elbow your way to that table. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like and some examples um, uh, as we get a bit farther into our conversation. So I want to just sort of set the stage for what's going to come. But now I'm kind of honor bound, as I said, to give you a little bit of an update of what is going on in that place known as Washington, D.C. Um, you may have seen that Congress has, at the moment, uh, single-digit approval ratings. Um, that means less than 10 percent. So it may seem like there's very much, there's a lot of polarization going on. There's not a lot of uh, agreement or um, cooperation. And on many issues, that's true. But on the issues of education and workforce, that's not true. There's actually a great deal more bipartisan cooperation and collaboration going on um, than on pretty much any other issue that Congress deals with right now. And so I did want to give you some updates both on what's going on with the federal budget, um, but more importantly on some major legislative reauthorizations that have implications for adult education. I'm also going to give you a quick update on immigration, um, which unlike uh, sort of education pure and simple is a much more polarizing issue, as I know many of you know. Okay, so just very briefly on the FY 2018 budget, this is the money for the year that ends this coming September 30th. Just a reminder, Congress last year didn't get their act together to pass one single set of appropriations bills, so we had all these little short-term continuing resolutions. But then ultimately in March of this year, uh, Congress finally agreed on an omnibus bill to take us through the last six months of the fiscal year. And the kind of takeaway good news from this is that there were very modest but notable increases in a number of key uh, education and workforce line items, probably most notably for most of you in this room, we owe a Title II or adult education funding. Um, so that was, that was notable. Now, of course, we're into the FY19 budget, right? That's the fiscal year that is beginning this coming October 1st. Um, it looks like Congress is not going to try to do a big omnibus bill. They are actually looking at doing separate appropriations bills. And without getting too deep into the Washington weeds, I will just remind you all that what we refer to as the federal budget is actually 12 separate spending bills, um, different amounts of appropriations for different areas of focus. And the one that's of most interest to all of us is what's known as the Labor H bill or the Labor HHS and Education bill. Um, and it does include the Department of Labor and the Department of Education funding. Congress needs to hear from you. 
They are having discussions now about the FY19 budget, and we need to keep the pressure on to ensure that at the very least level funding is maintained and perhaps even we see some additional modest increases. Um, and I'll talk more about this later, but I just wanted to emphasize for all that there's so many other issues and, and conversations going on, on the budget front, um, the next few weeks are important and Congress does need to be hearing from you. So if you are in a position where you as an advocate are able to do so, I know some of you are working in organizations where that may not be possible, um, contacting your legislator, phone calls are best um, because that means a human being has to stop what they're doing and pick up the phone and talk to you. But emails and letters also are valuable um, to, to emphasize the importance of adult education funding. And there are some really big pieces of legislation that are pending reauthorization. Now, jargony term, pending reauthorization, just a reminder for those of you who don't live and breathe Congress every day, Congress is fully capable of kicking the can down the road for years and not, legis not reauthorizing legislation just because it happens to have a due date stamped on it, right? So the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act was originally supposed to be reauthorized in 2003. It was not ultimately reauthorized until 2014, which you may notice is 11 years. So um, when I say that, that legislation is pending reauthorization, Congress does not have a drop-dead deadline that they must accomplish this by, but these bills are actually moving um, and there are things going on with them. So the Perkins Career and Technical Education Act, the House passed a bill last year, the Senate is now considering a bill. There has been a log jam in the Senate, but um, that log jam now seems to be coming unstuck, which is great. Why does this matter for adult education? Two reasons. One, nationally, 40% of all Perkins money goes to post-secondary programs. Um, some of those programs are programs in which high school students do two years at the high school level and then transfer into post-secondary, but others are specifically designed for and open to adult learners. Um, and then some of you may have also heard that Senator Reed from Rhode Island, who's been a longtime champion of adult education, has introduced a bill called CTE for All um, that would essentially hold uh, the CTE system's feet to the fire a little bit in terms of both including the state director for adult education in more of the CTE planning and open up the possibility that adult education providers could be eligible institutions for receiving Perkins funding, um, some, some adult ed providers. So that's an interesting proposal um, and in the parlance of Washington, revenue neutral, um, meaning there's no new money attached to it. It would just simply open up uh, access to existing funding. The Higher Education Act, um, I always like to remind folks because it was a shock to me when I first learned this fact. So the entire Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, Title I and Title II for workforce and adult education is about $3 billion in funding. The Higher Education Act has about $30 billion dollars in funding for Pell Grants. Now obviously Pell money goes to a lot of different things, but one of the things that Pell money supports is adult learners who are pursuing um, perhaps developmental or, or remedial education classes as they are on their path to some additional post-secondary education. So I just mention that because it's a lot of money and it's often underappreciated that this is an issue that really affects adult learners and organizations that serve adult learners even if you're not a community college person. Um, and there's also a really interesting piece of legislation called the Gateway to Careers Act. Um, so we have worked with Senator Hassan from New Hampshire um, and three other Democratic senators to introduce this bill um, earlier this year. Our members helped develop what this looks like, but basically what this bill says is for adults to succeed in community college or other post-secondary education, it's not just about the tuition. It is about support services and it is about the other kinds of childcare and transportation. All the things that we know can knock our learners off the path to accomplishing what we want to help them accomplish. Um, this is an aspirational bill, right? It would propose that Congress allocate several hundred million dollars in new funding. In the current Congress, there's not an appetite for advancing that ambitious of a proposal. But 
What there is an appetite for, and we've had a lot of conversations with Republican offices on the Hill, is a recognition that if what we want is to help more adults succeed in post-secondary education, we have to be real about what succeeding actually looks like. And we can't simply focus on tuition and Pell Grants to solve the tuition problem when we know that it's actually uh, you know, a, a much more complicated set of factors that can help adults learners succeed. So um, I'm happy to talk more, as I said later today, about the specifics of this legislation, but I wanted to, to put that out there because it is an, an interesting and I think really important discussion and I'm happy that we're having it uh, in Congress. Then there's the Farm Bill. Um, you may be sitting here thinking, what does the Farm Bill have to do with adult education? Um, some of you may be receiving money through the SNAP Employment and Training Grants, so uh, services to help people who are receiving food stamps uh, move into employment. It will come as no surprise to you when I say that statistically, most of the adults who are receiving food stamps have either a high school diploma or equivalent, or um, in many cases, they, they uh, have less than that, or they have some foundational skills gaps, right? Maybe they did finish high school, but their math skills are still pretty rusty, or their digital literacy is, is lacking in some respects. So this is very much an adult education issue. Um, the House introduced a really conservative version of the Farm Bill in terms of SNAP ENT, would have imposed a great deal more work requirements. National Skills Coalition did not support that legislation. The Senate has a more mixed bill that would uh, put some additional money out there to support states with their SNAP ENT pilots. Um, so happy again to talk more about that, but just wanted to flag that that's the other big piece of legislation. The White House uh, issued an executive order in the end of April that was basically uh, a, a wish list of we should consolidate anti-poverty programs and we should uh, eliminate uh, duplicative programs. It's an executive order. It doesn't have that much power in terms of what uh, well, has no power over Congress, um, and um, it's essentially a wish list, but it does signal the administration's issues and, and interests in this area, and there's been a lot of advocacy uh, by adult educators and other anti-poverty advocates to say, you know, if the problem you're trying to solve is poverty, then slashing and burning at the programs that um, are proven to actually help people build the skills they need to get better jobs is, is kind of... Um, shooting yourself in the foot. Okay, so I'm almost finished with the federal update. We'll get to the fun stuff in just a minute, but now we have to do the juggling of the most challenging thing there is out there right now, and that is immigration. So I know that about a third, one out of every three students nationally that is served through WIOA Title II uh, or AFLA is in an English language class, right? One out of every three. There's about 1.5 million adults served with federal, we owe a Title II money nationally, about 500,000 to 600,000, depending on what year you're looking at, are in ESL classes. And obviously, most of the folks in ESL classes are immigrants. There's, in some states, we have a pretty robust Puerto Rican population, but not so much here in California. Um, so, immigration issues affect the adult education landscape. And I know I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. Congress is looking to probably uh, discuss, maybe vote on two immigration bills this week. Um, there's a lot in both of those bills. The short answer to know for you about adult education is that neither one of them would solve any of the issues related to what is facing immigrant adult learners. Um, and neither one of them would provide a meaningful fix for DACA. That is the young adults who were brought here as children, who are known as dreamers, um, and who have been living in the US under temporary status that was launched by President Obama as the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. You may hear the media describe some of these bills as a DACA fix, they're not. Uh, they would provide, in one case at best, a sort of three-year temporary extension of DACA for people who already have it. Um, and in the other case, they would provide a long and arduous 20-plus year path to citizenship, 20-plus years, uh, of which the Cato Institute released an analysis this morning saying that about 82% of dreamers would eventually not be able to navigate that path to citizenship. So neither of these bills is a serious proposal for addressing the needs of adult learners and particularly of those who we know as dreamers. 
Um, there was an attempt uh, about a week ago by moderate Republicans and the entire Democratic caucus to get what's called a discharge petition, which is basically, um, I'm going to say this in the most colloquial way possible, uh, if you have a critical mass of Congress all gang up together, they can force the Speaker to bring a bill for debate and vote even if the Speaker doesn't want to do it. Um, that's the sort of colloquial explanation. And they came within two names of being able to have enough names on that discharge petition to force Speaker Ryan to bring the actual DREAM Act to a vote, which would have provided an actual path to citizenship for a substantial number of young people. Uh, they did not make it. They have one more shot this summer uh, in advance of July 23rd. So you may see that in the news, and I wanted to flag it um, if you uh, are passionate about this issue and you want to make sure that your congressperson is hearing from you, um, they need to hear from you before July 23rd about the urgency of signing on to that discharge petition, which just to be clear, the discharge petition would just bring four immigration bills to the floor for a vote, and whichever bill got the most votes would advance to the Senate for consideration. Um, it would not mean that the DREAM Act would necessarily pass by any means. The Senate is a whole different animal. Um, but I do think that's important sort of to know. And, and so that's what Queen of the Hill refers to, is this idea that um, uh, of the four bills that would come up for a vote, if the discharge petition forced that vote to happen, the one that had the most votes would be the queen of the hill and would be the one that would advance. Okay, now we have to talk about one more thing, and I'd like to hear just briefly um, if you have ever heard the term public charge, even if you don't know what it means, please clap. Okay, so this is a super arcane piece of immigration law that I would have expected, had I asked you three months ago, zero people would have clapped um, because you're not a room full of immigration lawyers and why, why should you have? Um, but I wanna flag this because this is a tsunami that if and when it hits will dramatically affect adult education programs, dramatically. Um, it's hard to overstate how serious this could be. So this is a draft regulation that the Trump administration is expected to release any day now. It has not been formally released, but a copy was leaked to the media earlier this spring. And so everything we know about it is based on that leaked draft. Essentially what this would do is dramatically change the rules for how the U.S. government counts whether an immigrant is a public charge. A public charge is somebody who's dependent on the government for support. Um, and traditionally, we've only counted you as a public charge if you were getting cash welfare benefits that form more than half your income or if you were getting full-time institutional care, right, if you were in a nursing home. And the idea here was to prevent people from moving to the United States simply for the benefit of being able to get, for example, full-time nursing care. Um, the, proposes, the proposed changes that we see um, likely to come from the administration based on the leaked draft would count against you um, a whole laundry list of negative factors about an enormous range of state, local, tribal, and federal public benefits. Everything from whether you purchase your health insurance on the Obamacare or ACA exchanges to whether you uh, draw on a whole range of nutrition programs to support your family to an enormous range of, of other activities. I'm not gonna go into detail about this policy proposal now. It's too wonky. Um, it's also still very speculative. What I want you to take away from this is two things. First of all, while we owe a Title II would not be something that would count against, right? So participating in an English class that was funded by WIOA would not count against an immigrant in this public charge determination. An enormous range of other benefits that help adult learners succeed or help their U.S. citizen children succeed would count against immigrants. And we expect that if this regulation were proposed, there would be an enormous chilling effect and then a bunch of immigrants who these regulations might not even apply to would decide out of an abundance of caution to disenroll themselves from programs and to step back um, from services that we know can actually help them and their families persist and succeed in their education. So this is a topic of great concern. National Skills Coalition, once the regulations are announced, we will be issuing sample public comments and we'll be asking as many people as possible to submit public comments in opposition to the regulations. 
Um, most of the public conversation about this has really focused on the nutrition part and the public health part. That's really important. That's not my role. Uh, I'm going to focus on education and workforce. So I wanted to flag for you that this is likely to be happening and that it could really affect adult learners. Um, this is about people who are legally present in the United States. Right now, according to the Migration Policy Institute, about 3% of non-US citizens would be subject to the public charge test. Post this regulation, they're estimating that about 47% of non-US citizens would be subject to the public charge test. So it's an enormous sea change in terms of how many people would be affected. OK, so that's the federal update. Now we get to talk about the much more fun and engaging stuff um, and, and the reason I think that all of us get out of bed every morning and do the work that we do and serve the people that we serve. Um, certainly there's continued WIOA implementation happening. There are a number of states that are now imposing work requirements on Medicaid recipients. I'm not going to go into great depth about that because most of those states are not here on the West Coast. Um, in fact, I'm not aware of any West Coast states that have yet done that. Um, and we'll talk more about the post-secondary credential attainment goals in a second. Okay, so back to the people, right? That was a lot of legislation and updates about Washington. Um, I want to go back to why we all do this work and in particular about your role, right? So we spend a lot of time thinking about we owe a compliance. Oh, we have to have an MOU with our Title I partners. Oh, we have to uh, submit our data, and what does that look like? We have to you know, understand what measurable skill gain is now. We're, we're looking at program exit, and what does that mean? Those are important questions, and you have a lot of sessions here uh, to talk about those things. I'm not going to talk about those things. Um, I'm going to talk about some interesting and creative things that your, your colleagues in other parts of the country are working on, and hopefully that will trigger some ideas and some thinking on your part. Um, so the first is Maryland has done some really creative work with Title I and Title II co-enrollment. So a lot of you may know these numbers nationally are tiny. Right? People are very rarely co-enrolled in both workforce and adult education services. There's a lot of reasons for that. Maryland decided to use some of their governor's discretionary funds for uh, we owe a Title I to put out a call for proposals um, and tell their local workforce boards, uh, thou shalt have an adult education partner if you are going to apply for this funding. Um, and that this is career pathways funding that really needs both partners at the table. And I flag it not because other states haven't done uh, somewhat similar things, although I think this one is particularly interesting, um, but because that's one way that a state can signal to the workforce partners, hey, take your adult education partners seriously. They should be an equal player with you at this table thinking about what career pathways actually look like for actual people and not what they look like in theory or on paper, right? Um, and so Maryland's grants, interestingly enough, two out of the three grants, they, they were fairly good-sized grants. I think they were 500,000, um, if I remember correctly. And uh, two out of the three actually ended up focusing on English language learners, which was not um, a priority under the grant, but just happened to be sort of how it shook out. Um, so that's kind of an interesting um, approach. They also issued uh, a really interesting policy guidance on joint assessment, right? So I like to jokingly refer to this as how not to tabe people to death or how not to cuss people to death, right? Is that people walk in the door for one program, they get administered an assessment, and then it turns out that program has a waiting list or doesn't have a class at the right time, and they go down the street, they get referred to another provider, and guess what? There's, they administer the assessment, right? Um, and so Maryland's policy really said, um, can we have our workforce partners and our adult education partners go through the same assessment training so that our adult educators will trust that the results of the workforce administrated assessments are accurate, right? Because I know many of us in this room are thinking, well, the reason we administer the assessments is because we don't really trust their results. Um, uh, and, you know, sometimes for good reason, but um, having them go through the training together helped to reduce the burden on learners of taking those duplicative assessments. So that's an interesting sort of policy tweak. Um, I put this picture of this exploring young person on here because I'm about to share some examples of non-workforce uh, board, non-Title I partners that you may, maybe you're already thinking of, already partnering with, maybe you're not. Um, 
And I hope that you'll hear these in the spirit of exploration and not in the spirit of a list of shoulds, right? Because I don't want you to walk out of here thinking, gosh, I already have only 24 hours a day and a whole bunch of things I need to accomplish. And now Amanda thinks I'm also supposed to be building bridges with six different kinds of uh, separate partners. That's not the message here. Hopefully the message is that maybe one of these kinds of partners will spark some interest and engagement on your part. Um, and this gets back to the sort of uh, elbowing our way to the table here, right? Um, and this is that list I showed you before and we're gonna go through these one at a time. Um, so the first thing here is industry sector partnerships, right? This idea of bringing together 10 or 12 employers in the same industry to talk about their talent needs. And I flag it here because while WIOA requires that workforce boards do this, um, it's happening really differently in different parts of the country. But in some parts of the country, we've definitely been hearing that employers are having some aha moments in realizing that they have people already on the payroll in some cases who have adult literacy gaps, right? And they are, they, that's not always intuitively obvious to employers, like, oh, the reason he's flunking his safety training is not because he doesn't care about safety, but it's because he can't actually read the material safety data sheet that he wants to read. That's our bread and butter. That's what we do, right? We know how to help people look at realia, how to develop curricula that are responsive to employer needs. So. This gets back to the elbowing our way to the table, right? If you aren't already in conversation with your local workforce board about how they're approaching the sector piece of this and whether they are thinking about the adult education implications or whether they're just sort of starting under the assumption of like, well, we're gonna assume that everybody has a high school diploma equivalent and then we're gonna talk about the training they need. Um, that's a good conversation to, to try to start to have. Um, the flip side of that conversation, right, is that nationally at least 62, sometimes higher percentages of adult learners are already working. And so what I have flagged on the slide here is a really creative effort that English for New Bostonians did. They did a very simple 10 question survey of all of their adult learners about where they were working, what kind of jobs they had. They didn't ask for the name of the employer, but they asked for the industry and they asked for the occupation, the job title. They asked how many other English learners were at the company where the person was working. Um, National Skills Coalition was the one that did the data analysis for this, which is why I happen to know about it. Um, but it was a really powerful report, not because it was such a surprise to adult educators, right? Because adult educators, we know who's in our classrooms, right? We know our students are falling asleep at the 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. class because they worked a long shift and then got home and helped their kids with homework and made them dinner and then came to class. Um, but employers and chambers of commerce and sometimes funders don't always know that. Um, and so English for New Bostonians is very um, uh, open and friendly to having other people take their little 10 question survey and use it in their own classrooms or their own programs. So this may be something you've already done in your program, but if you haven't and you want to borrow theirs, uh, they are more than welcome, uh, more than happy to share it with you um, and can really help sort of shake up people's presumptions. And then you walk into your local workforce board and you say, you know what, I happen to have a graduate student over the summer volunteer with my organization and she administered this little 10 question survey to folks and here's what I can tell you about the kinds of jobs that adult learners already have. So don't think about incumbent workers as people who have no literacy gaps or no math gaps or digital literacy gaps. Guess what? Folks are pretty ingenious about coming up with coping mechanisms for themselves. They say I'll take the memo home to read tonight, right? Or I forgot my glasses. We as educators know that these are strategies that adult learners use to, to cover up the fact that maybe their skills are not the strongest. Um, that's not always evident to people who aren't educators or who don't think about these things at, at the level that you do. Regional economic development, right? So I used to jokingly say, and um, some of you who know economic development folks may know this, um, that business attraction has often been about big game hunting. How do we get an employer with 700 jobs to come move to our location? Um, and sometimes it still is, right? How do we create tax breaks? But often it's also about helping small and mid-sized employers to be able to grow where they already are. And part of that, um, and some chambers of commerce are much farther out in recognizing this than others, is recognizing that the workforce is a key part of businesses being able to grow. Um, so I put the Nashville Chamber on here because they have some really awesome reports on their website and I 
strongly encourage you to go and, and look at them. If you're not already talking to your Chamber of Commerce about why adult education should be a player in their business development and attraction strategy conversations, it's a good conversation to have, right? Again, this is one possibility. I'm going through a hand, handful here. You may say, you know, not a fit for us in our community because of XYZ reasons, or we've tried and we're feeling like we're beating our head against a wall. That may be true in your local context, but it can be really effective. Um, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs did a really interesting report on immigrants specifically, helping to revitalize older industrial communities. I recommend that report to you. It is on the Chicago Council website. It's pretty easy to find. Um, they focused on the Midwest, but to be honest, it has pretty broad applicability to any part of the country that has a smaller city that maybe has been losing population. And again, these are conversations where other people often don't think to invite adult educators to the table. So this is us bringing ourselves to the table. State and local immigrant integration offices. Six states now have an office of new Americans in the governor's office or some equivalent state level initiative. 30 cities now have a mayor's office of immigrant affairs. There has been an explosion of these in the last five years. Um, many times these offices are run by lovely people who either trained as immigration lawyers or who come out of some other kind of public policy background. They are usually not adult educators, right? And so they may be hearing that ESL is in need, but they aren't necessarily hearing about who in my community is a potential partner, how might we be able to braid funding together. Um, so if this is a topic that's interesting to you, I have good news, which is that my following session at 1030 this morning is gonna focus very narrowly on exactly this question. Um, and I'm also happy to email my slides if you can't make my session because there's too many other wonderful sessions at the same time. Um, so if you want to dig deeper, uh, lots to say there. 40 states, in collaboration with the Lumina Foundation, have now set post-secondary credential attainment goals, right? Jargony term that basically means um, we want 60% of Texas's population to have achieved a post-secondary credential by the year 2030, right? Or, or something equivalent to that. No state is going to be able to get to its goal if all they focus on are the kids coming out of K-12 schools and going straight into post-secondary. Adult education has got to be part of the conversation. Not all states have really internalized or grasped that yet. So National Skills Coalition has done a series of fact sheets. We've done about a dozen states so far, um, focusing in, in this case particularly on immigrant workers to sort of say, you know what, you've set this big ambitious goal for post-secondary credential attainment, you're not gonna get there unless you really look at adult learners as part of the solution. So regardless of whether your state happens to have a lot of immigrants or not, you might wanna take a look at our fact sheets which are on our website um, just to see how we frame the story there. Right? Um, and again, this gets a different kind of conversation going because instead of going to your mayor's office or your governor's office and saying, we need more funding for adult education, you're going in there to say, you know that big ambitious goal you just laid out in your agenda? We can help you get there. Can you help us be more creative about additional resources that we can draw on so that we can help you get there? That's a different kind of conversation, right? Um, just a subtle tweak in, in kind of how it's being approached. State longitudinal data systems, which go by the term SLEDs. Um, my fellow data geeks in the room are probably drooling at this point. The rest of you are probably like, eh, not so much. Um, adult education is included in about 30 state state longitudinal data systems. Why does this matter? A longitudinal data system allows states to be able to put together data from the K-12 system to see who's graduating from high school, the higher ed system to see who's enrolled in community college or the state four-year universities, and then the payroll records to see who's working and what kind of jobs they're working in. And that allows states to use what's called a pathway evaluator tool. Right? which says, huh, what are the pathways that people take that are working well for them, and what are the ones that have bottlenecks or blockages? Washington State used a pathway evaluator tool when they developed the iBEST program, the Integrated Basic Education and Skills Training program that became the basis for what we all know as IET under WIOA. Um, if you are interested in the idea of pathway evaluators, we have a great publication. It's on our website. Um, some advocates, and in Minnesota they've been super brave and thoughtful and smart about this, have pushed their state government to say, you know what, don't just look at 
uh, sort of mass groups of adult learners and how they're succeeding, break it out so that you can tell us how are Somali immigrants in Minnesota doing? How are Native Americans who, or American Indians, you know, doing? Um, so if you're interested in that Minnesota deed, their Department of, of uh, Employment and Economic Development has some really interesting reports publicly available on their website. Um, and I'm also happy to do intros to, to folks there if you want to dig deeper and, and talk to them. Then there's reentry, right? So people re-entering society after having been incarcerated. Some of us know these folks because they come into our classrooms um, because we have a connection to a corrections adult ed program, right? Maybe they came out of an adult ed program when they were in prison or in jail, um, and now they're, they're out. Others we know just because they happen to walk in the door and they say, if I enroll in your GED class, can you give me a form I can show my probation officer, right? Um, sometimes we never know, right, until the trauma somehow uh, erupts in a different aspect in our, in our classroom. Um, but I think we're at a really interesting moment now in this country in which there's both more discussion about the effects of mass incarceration and the awareness of things like the opioid crisis, which sort of intertwine with that. But there's also initiatives, right? The occupational licensing initiative that I have on here, the Department of Labor put seven and a half million dollars at the end of the Obama administration into a new initiative to make sure there weren't barriers for people when they are trying to get licensed in a profession or occupation as a barber, as a dentist, as a whatever, um, when they move from state to state, right? Or even within a state. They frame this initiative as primarily being about military spouses and veterans, right? Because those folks move a lot. But they've also been very explicit about including formerly incarcerated people and people with criminal records. And we know that oftentimes occupational licensing barriers can be a challenge. Why am I mentioning this to a room full of adult educators? Not because you need to suddenly become occupational licensing experts, but because, again, that's a conversation where the National Governors Association and the National Conference of State Legislatures, which are leading this national initiative, they need to be hearing from adult education about the fact that, you know what, this is not speculative for us, right? These folks are in our classrooms, they need our services, and we recognize the hunger that they have and this amazing moment we have with low national unemployment um, where we really want to help them make that leap into actually being able to support themselves and their families, they need that support. Um, and so I wanted to flag also a really wonderful example from Kansas. Some of you may know Jillian Gabelman, um, really amazing work. Kansas uh, created an integrated education and training program for women in a correctional facility, I think in Topeka, um, so that they could go through an IET program and then um, be able to have a credential when they left the correctional institution and be able to, again, uh, support themselves and their families. Some of you are probably working in corrections programs. Some of you are probably working in programs outside of corrections, but seeing folks who are returning from incarceration. I wanted to flag this explicitly because so much of the reentry conversation nationally is all about get a job, get a job, get a job, and relatively little of it is about, you know, Folks either had a bad K-12 experience or they had interrupted schooling. Maybe they got a GED in prison. Often they didn't. So adult education really has something to contribute to these conversations, and yet we're, we're not always invited to the table, right? So this gets back to the elbowing our way. There's the theme. Um, and we have a whole range of resources on the National Skills Coalition website that I hope can help you as you reach out, whether you're reaching out to your Chamber of Commerce to talk to them about economic development, whether you're reaching out to your um, state longitudinal data folks to talk about adult ed data and pathway evaluators. We have a one-pager called Adult Education, a Crucial Foundation for Middle Skill Jobs. Uh, we have a whole long report on foundational skills for service sector workers. So what does it mean for retail, hospitality, and healthcare workers who are holding down a job but still have some skill gaps? And what can adult education do to be part of the solution there? I hope that you'll use these materials to advocate for your learners and for your programs. And I hope that you'll just pick one bite-sized idea out of the laundry list of things I just ran through here to say, you know what, that piece seems interesting to me, or that could build on something interesting that we've already done. Or you know what, I'm gonna buttonhole Amanda later. Um, 
my favorite thing ever is when people brag to me about the awesome stuff they're doing. So come find me and tell me about the great stuff that you're doing that I should talk about next time I come in front of an audience like this. Um, I deliberately did not include a lot of California and West Coast examples here because I wanted to give you a flavor of things that are happening in other parts of the country. Um, but I also recognize um, that there is a lot of great stuff happening here, and I want to hear about it. So the last uh, chunk of time that we have here before I let you go and get ready for your next sessions is really talking about what does it look like to bring your practitioner wisdom into policy conversations. And again, I want to be real here, right? You only have 24 hours in a day. I hope that you're spending seven or eight hours sleeping. I hope that you're seeing your families. So. I'm not meaning to list these things as yet another set of shoulds that you should feel guilty about not having done. Um, I'm really intending to say, you know what? You are the vertical integration between the work on the ground and the policy on paper. And you are really the only people who have experienced what policy looks like when it actually, when, when the rubber hits the road. Um, so we talk a lot about the metacognitive skills we have to teach our learners, right? Thinking about thinking. Um, that also applies to us, right? Thinking about our work, not just in the sense of executing the program or the contract that we've been called upon to execute or complying with the regulation or the guidance that we've been issued or making sure our staff is trained and we've got professional development, but also thinking about the work that we do, how to tell its story, how to insert ourselves into conversations that need to happen, and frankly, how to get more resources for our field, right? Um, in Seattle, some advocacy there through their race and social justice initiative resulted in successfully using community development block grant money to support adult ESL classes and then getting the, the Seattle City Council members so excited about the program that they used some local city, city council money to expand the program into their council districts, right? So sometimes these conversations are not just about trying to do more with less with that little bit of we owe a Title II or AFLA money that you have or that California Adult Education Block Grant money that you have, but also about bringing fresh resources in to the work that you're doing. Um, so that bringing your expertise to new tables, right? Have you met with your local newspaper's editorial board, right? That's a relatively bite-sized thing. It's not crazy difficult to set up a meeting like that. You can invite them to your annual student graduation. You can share with them a couple of facts about your program and try to have them write an editorial about how does adult education fit into the issues that our community is facing, right? They don't get that many requests from the general public for a meeting, they'll probably sit down with you. Um, that's assuming you still have a local, uh, local newspaper in your community, which in this crazy world of journalism that we're living in is not always the case. Um, but, but they are telling the stories that policymakers are reading, right? Um, Congress people have staff who read their hometown newspaper. And if you can have an employer that you're partnering with or others get an op-ed published, if you can have that editorial board do an editorial on adult education, that's a way of getting your issue in front of congressional staff and then you bring that as a clip or a leave behind when you meet with that office. Um, and then bring your learners along. How many of you use the wonderful quarterly newspaper, The Change Agent, in your classroom? Can clap if you, if you do. Okay, so a handful of you. That means the rest of you have yet to discover it. So it's a great publication. It's put out by World Education in Boston. Um, and it's a quarterly publication by and for adult learners. Um, it's terrific on a number of fronts, in part because it helps our learners develop a sense of efficacy, right? I can write something. I can tell a story. I can be heard. Um, and it helps them build their advocacy muscles, right? They can go on a visit with you to a policymaker's office. They can help you host a visit if a policymaker is coming to your office. And then, of course, um, there's other, uh, other activities, too. If this is appealing to you but you don't know where to start, please call me or talk to me when I'm here today. National Skills Coalition exists to help you with exactly this kind of thing. We don't expect that all of our members in the field are going to be experts in how to engage with a policymaker or what to say if you do or what you might be trying to elicit from them. That's what we're here for. Um, so I hope 
that you have found something to nibble on in all of the things that we've talked about here this morning. Um, I hope that you'll think of yourself as deserving of the microphone um, and that you'll imagine yourself um, having the, the opportunity to advocate for learners in whatever context you might find yourself. Um, and here are three things that you can do. The simplest and easiest thing is to contact your congressperson and advocate for at least level and hopefully funding at the full authorized level in the FY19 budget. Adult education is important. Please fund it. Very simple. It's a 90-second phone call. Um, and the lovely 22-year-olds in the congressional offices who answer the phone will be delightful to talk to, I promise you. Um, the worst thing that will happen is that they will say to you, what is your zip code? Because they are trying to check to see if you are a real constituent or not. Um, so that is, that is the most complicated question you're likely to get. Um, the second thing is National Skills Coalition has a whole set of state policy toolkits, right? We do these things called 50 state scans to say, does your state have a policy on integrated education and training? Or does your state have a policy on stackable credentials? And then we have policy toolkits. They're on our website. Um, and again, happy to hop on the phone with you and talk about them. And then, for those of you who work on immigration issues, um, be ready when National Skills Coalition sends out the action alert in a few days or a few weeks or whenever it may happen to submit comments in opposition to that public charge regulation uh, that I talked about. So we are here to help. Um, but I want to leave you with two images, right? So one is we often feel like we're fighting fires all the time, right? We are responding to a crisis or triaging a million different things that have to happen. Um, but we also are planting for the longer term, right? And it's really hard sometimes to get that moment and think about the seedling when you're like, but the forest is burning down. I get it. I really get it, which is why we had this incredibly precious hour this morning. And I hope um, that some of it was useful to you, or at least that looking at the beautiful green will lower your blood pressure for just a minute. Um, thank you all so much. Please come and talk with me today. Please contact me. And thank you for the work that you do.